Yeah, so this is Seaborgium, which I have a periodic table here. It'd probably be helpful if I point it out to you. It's right down here, more or less in the middle, but very much towards the bottom. And this is in a row of elements that are really quite special because these guys come after the lanthanides and actinides, which are these two rows down here. And these elements are special because they don't hang around very long. These elements are actually really unstable and they decay. This is radioactivity at work. So if you want to do anything with these, you've got to actually make the elements. You can't just go to a chemical company and buy a jar of them. You've actually got to make them. And then you've got to turn them into a compound that you're interested in and analyze it very, very quickly. And some of these elements, they can come and go within 8, 10, 15 seconds, minutes. They really don't hang around. You, you've made them. What do you want to do with them? Well, the answer could be, let's make some interesting molecules out of them that we can study and therefore learn about some of the properties that these elements have. Because at the minute, because there's so little known about them, because A, they're very difficult to make, and even if you do make them, they come and go so quickly, we don't have very much experimental evidence to help to validate the theoretical models we've got. And the theories are really great, but we need to know that they're accurate. And so, for example, Seaborgium should be very similar to analogous group six metals higher up, like tungsten, molybdenum, and chromium. These are very well known, quite well understood elements. You can make nice stable compounds out of them that will hang around for weeks, months, and years. And you expect certain periodic trends to occur as you go down that group from chromium to molybdenum to tungsten. And the question is, what then happens when you go to the really super heavy seaborgium in the next row down. And so you can predict what you might expect, but what you need to do is go out and do some experiments to help validate that theory. So the news is that uh, a research team prepared some seaborgium, and this is a really elegant reaction. They take some curium, which is element number 96, and they smash some neon into it, which is element number 10, and that gives you together element 106, which is seaborgium. Now the clock's ticking because already they're going to start to fall to bits. And so the answer is, well, the question rather is, what are you going to do? And this particular piece of research is really elegant because what it does is it generates the seaborgium atoms and very quickly reacts them with carbon monoxide. And the thing about carbon monoxide is it can bond to metal atoms. In fact, this is one of the reasons why carbon monoxide is not good for humans. If you inhale it, it sticks onto the iron in your haemoglobin and stops oxygen being transported around your body. But in this case, this has been used to our advantage that you can make a seaborgium with six carbon monoxides bonded to it. And this is really helpful because now it turns out that this molecule is volatile. And because it's volatile, you can get it into the gas phase, quickly whip it off to a detector, and then confirm that you've made it. So the reason it's important is it's a volatile compound that you can examine and you would expect it to be very similar to the analogous chromium, molybdenum and tungsten carbonyls and importantly they've been known for many decades and we understand their properties very well. And indeed earlier today we were just subliming some uh, group 6 metal carbonyls just to show how they go from being a solid into the gas phase and then they come back out again as a lovely crystalline solid. And you would expect the seaborgium carbonyl to be just like this. The problem is you can't make anywhere near as much of the seaborgium carbonyl and it doesn't hang around long enough to go and put it in a jar. So the idea um, behind the project is that you make the analogous molybdenum and tungsten systems in situ on the same system and then when you do it with seaborgium you know what you're looking for and through a very interesting and advanced set of arrays, it's very elegant work, you can then detect the seaborgium carbonyl coming out of this system where you've made the atoms of seaborgium, added the carbon monoxide and then fired it down to a detector. So that they've got a bank of uh, detectors which they have to calibrate and they do all sorts of control experiments. Uh, my understanding is one of the ways 
they were looking out to make sure they had the seaborgium is that seaborgium decays through a certain number of processes which I think are fairly well uh, understood and you can predict. And this series of transformations shows up in the detectors and nothing like that can happen when there's no seaborgium around. So if it does occur, you know it has to be down to the seaborgium. I can easily understand the reason to create a molecule involving seaborgium in order to test the theories of what will happen. Were our theories correct? Mm -hmm. Harder to understand, perhaps, is why it's even worth having good, solid theories of what seaborgium will do. Because seaborgium will always be uh, something that falls apart and doesn't exist for very long. So do we need a huge wealth of knowledge about it? It's not like it's going to help other chemists because no one can work with this thing anyway. No, well, I disagree with you there, actually. I think it does help other chemists because part... Actually, the theory aspect, you can't overstate how important that is because we are only as good as our understanding of the natural world around us. And that's a bit like saying Mars is a long way away and so therefore I don't care what goes on there. You should care what goes on there because it will inform you about the basic principles and the laws that our universe operates under. And so in, when you read the paper about this seaborg carbonyl, there's a discussion about how will the carbon monoxide bond to the metal and will it be stronger or weaker than the analogous chromium, molybdenum and tungsten systems. Now this is really important because remember I've already said carbon monoxide will bond to iron and poison you. We need to understand how these types of molecules do interact with these metal centres because this informs our understanding of chemistry in a much broader context. So although it seems like a really specialist, very unusual thing that no one would care about. It's actually got quite profound implications for our broader understanding of chemistry. Uh, finally, I guess finally it got approved in 1997, and it got approved soon enough so Seaborg could stand at the periodic table like this and point to his element. And we were so happy that he was still alive and could point here, this is Seaborgium.